Hello, everybody. Happy New Year. Welcome to ASBN Live, hosted by us at the American Sustainable Business Network. I'm Thulisi Sivalingam, the Senior Manager of Programming and Events, and we're so excited to kick off our 2023 webinars with this really exciting panel. The session is called Climate Fingerprints, How Corporate Cash is Fueling the Climate Crisis and What Businesses Can Do About It. We're thrilled to have our member Seventh Generation, as well as representatives from their movement leading advocacy organization to talk about the creation of their new framework for climate, climate reporting. So to tell you some of the people that we have here with us today, we have Kate Ogden, who is the head of advocacy and movement building at Seventh Generation. We have Mary Cerulli, founder of Climate Finance Action. Duncan Mizell, Executive Director of Clean Creatives. And we have Paul Moynister, the Executive Director of Topo. And from our very own team, we have our CEO and co-founder, Jeffrey Hollander, who's going to now tell us a little bit more. Thanks, everybody. Thrilled to have you with us. Very exciting uh, webinar that we're doing today. The webinar is brought to you by the American Sustainable Business Network, which as most of you know, is a leading national organization that advocates for public policy, works on sustainable investments through Investor Circle, and has a wonderful group of uh, networking capabilities to bring entrepreneurs together to solve pressing problems. Today's webinar is really an exciting one and very close to my heart as I still serve on the uh, sustainable advisory board of seventh generation. When I saw a draft of this fingerprints report, I said, this is truly groundbreaking. It is a redefinition of the way in which we need to think about companies' responsibility for their CO2 emissions and their impact on climate change. This is really important in a world in which there is so much fighting back against ESG progress Seventh Generation is a company that is really moving forward and raising the bar for companies in general. To kick this off, we'll start by hearing from Kate Ogden, who is the head of advocacy and movement building at Seventh Generation and was a key figure in crafting this report. Kate? Thanks so much, Jeffrey. Hi, everyone. Um, I appreciate the introduction. Um, again, my name is Kate Ogden. I'm the head of advocacy and movement building at Seventh Generation, and I uh, was very excited to be able to work on this revisioning of our um, corporate impact report. I'm going to pull up a presentation to share with you all as we go. Make that bigger for you. All right. Um, before I get started, just very quickly, would love to just share some um, thanks and appreciation both for ASBN and Jeffrey um, for the support around this work and, and um, organizing this webinar. Really excited to share what we learned through this report. And then so grateful to the panelists that are joining me today. Seventh Generation would not have been able to, to uh, create this methodology or move forward uh, with this new approach on reporting if we didn't have the support, the expertise, um, the knowledge, and really, you know, sort of the co-conspirators that we've had um, from folks across the climate justice movement, but particularly the folks um, and organizations represented on this call. Really excited for you all to hear directly from them today on the way that they approach their work and how it informs not just fingerprints, but hopefully um, a new wave and a sort of a, 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 a new um, watershed moment in how uh, corporations across industries start to think about not only their climate impact reporting, but also the strategies that they set um, to address their climate impact going forward. So thanks in advance to all of them. Um, and we can jump into it and take you through a little bit of how we got to um, the fingerprints report and what we've learned and what we're doing from here. So seventh generation um, has you know, had a long history of 
not only advocacy and activism, but of also setting standards around sustainability. Um, Starting in 2001, we helped lobby for the removal of phosphates from auto dish um, products. We set an industry standard to eliminate uh, volatile organic compounds in home products. Um, more recently, we have worked to pass legislation at the state level in places like California and Vermont around safer chemicals, um, including in Vermont, the Toxin-Free Families Act in 2014. Um, so this type of standard setting and redefining what leadership and sustainability uh, has really been part of Seventh Generation's DNA from the beginning. And that includes um, the way that we approach our corporate impact reporting. So 7th Gen was really an early adopter of creating uh, impact report. Our first was released in 2003, um, and it has evolved since then. Um, it has gone through several iterations, bringing us up to um, 2021. And through that evolution, we've always been a trailblazer, not just because we were an early adopter um, in the process of corporate impact reporting, but because we've always set a very high standard for ourselves in terms of um, radical transparency, being very, very clear about what it is that we're setting out to do, what's challenging us, where we're falling short of our own expertise expectations and standards, where we're making progress, and where we're going from here. Um, we have consistently put out what has been considered best in class uh, reports in the um, corporate impact. Since we started reporting in 2003, as I'm sure everyone on this call is very well aware, the landscape has changed tremendously. We have seen now 80% of the S&P 500 is reporting on annual carbon emissions. Um, so it's no longer unique. It's no longer sort of a niche kind of green product or green brand um, uh, standard to have a corporate impact report or to have um, report out uh, report outs on our carbon emissions. We also see that while many companies are starting to perform better on disclosures, there's still some key elements and rigor missing. So there's a very robust conversation happening right now around, for example, the concept of net zero, whether or not that has enough rigor to it, whether those commitments have enough meat to them and are actually driving the type of change that we need to see. And of course, we're also seeing in the last several years, I think an appropriate increase in the scrutiny of um, corporate uh, disclosures, corporate impact reporting around climate. Um, and so all of these factors combined, I think, let us know that this is a good opportunity for a change. We really felt it was time to push the practice of corporate reporting forward. We know that our climate impact isn't just about the material and ingredient choices or the energy that we and our consumers use when we're making our products or when our consumers are using our products in their homes. I think one of the biggest, the biggest piece that we saw was really missing in the current standard of corporate impact reporting and specifically around climate impact reporting is corporate cash. We know that every single dollar that we spend and invest across our business leaves a trail of climate impact. We look at our supply chain when we're assessing emissions, but money is a supply chain in and of itself. We're talking about dollars and cents instead of goods and materials, but all along the length as capital ebbs and flows, as incomes arrive, as expenses are paid, dozens of investments are being made in everything from marketing services to technology. And that cash is also handled by banks that have been hired to handle each of those transactions. When we set out to create a new type of report, we had a few objectives that we wanted to hit. One, we wanted to make the case, this isn't just about seventh gen, but ultimately also about influencing our peers across the industry. We wanted to make the case for a more comprehensive approach to assessing corporate carbon impacts. We wanna make sure that when we are setting strategy, we have all of the information. We're looking at every place across our entire business that we are driving climate impact and setting strategy against that. We wanted to make sure that we're assessing our climate risks and impacts, not only in the places that we traditionally have done that, scopes one through three, looking at our products and supply chain, but also at what we're calling our climate fingerprint. So where are we investing? Where, what is the climate impact of the money that we're spending and investing across marketing, banking, insurance, investments, public finance, our advocacy work, and our philanthropy? And then most importantly, we wanted to identify clear areas for improvement and where we were going to drive future strategy across the business. So we wanted to include two uh, 
two aspects of the report. One is the quantitative analysis. And we worked um, with folks like the Outdoor Policy Outfit, who you'll hear with in a bit, to come up with um, an estimate of our financed emissions. And then we also worked with many, many partners who I'll, I'll talk about in a moment to do a qualitative assessment of our climate strategy and, um, and our impact best practices. So when we looked at the different areas that we wanted to touch on, uh, we looked at our marketing services, we looked at banking and finance, we looked at the insurance services that we procure as a business, um, investments, including our retirement um, accounts, our advocacy program, and our uh, foundation. As you can see on here, this is not even an exhaustive list, but this is some of the many organizations that we worked with to develop the methodology, um, to review the the methodology and early drafts as we went forward. So this was very much a collaborative effort. I'm not going to um, recap the entire report for you all, but I will um, share a link to the report in the chat shortly. But I just wanted to touch on some of the lessons learned at a high level. When we looked at, um, for example, our finance and insurance financed emissions, what we found is that the finance emissions from those areas are equivalent to the emissions from our top ingredient, SLS. So while it's not a huge amount of emissions in absolute terms, we have a sustainability strategy that is designed to reduce emissions from our ingredients, including SLS. So the fact that we have a strategy to re reduce emissions on the sustainability side, looking at things like our um, materials, ingredients, and packaging, but we don't currently have a sustainability or a, a emissions reduction strategy in place when we're looking at things like our financed emissions was a real flag for us and let us know where we have gaps and where we need to change our approach going forward. From a qualitative standpoint, we saw that there was a real lack of transparency among many of our finance and insurance partners. Many of them did not have things in place like science-based targets. Um, very few of them had um, clear guardrails around the types of um, clients or customers that they would work with. So these were all areas that we assessed um, for wanting to improve going forward. The other piece I'll touch on briefly um, was looking at our marketing services. So this was a really interesting area for us to take a look at. We surveyed all of our marketing service partners across the entire business. And some of the things that we saw is that it is clear that this is an area where businesses need need a methodology that they can use to quantify the emissions from our marketing and creative services. We didn't have a great way to approach this right off the bat. We also know that at the end of the day, when we're talking about our marketing service partners, the goal is for us to engage them. Ultimately, it doesn't seem helpful for us to walk away from a marketing service partner who is not um, evolving their approach. Um, but for us to engage them and collaboratively work uh, to change their practices. So we know that as a relatively small company, even as we have a large parent company, we don't necessarily have the influence and the sway that we would like to have with some of our biggest marketing service providers. Um, and this is where we turn to the idea of collective action, wanting to enlist more businesses um, that have the same commitment that we have around reducing our climate impact to work with us, understanding that our collective power, the influence that we have um, together is much stronger than the influence that any one um, company has on their own. Similarly, looking across uh, some of the qualitative uh, information that we found a lot of our partners were, were lagging across the board in terms of their public disclosure of climate risks. Very, very few of them had any guardrails in terms of who they would work with, um, specifically whether or not they would, um, in addition to working with a company like Seventh Generation, work with um, fossil fuel or fossil fuel um, related organizations. Most of them did not have um, science-based climate commitments. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done for us as we think about how we're going to be engaging our partners going forward. In terms of next steps, there's a lot of work <laughs> for us to do, and we are actively shaping that, which is very exciting work for us over the next several years. Um, but in terms of that kind of the high level, um, we are actively engaging our parent company, Unilever, um, helping to share what we have learned uh, to hopefully influence how they approach sustainability going forward and to enlist their help. 
um, in engaging many of our ancillary uh, business partners. Our next priority is to engage like-minded companies. Um, I will share my contact information in the chat after this as well. I would love to hear from anyone on the call who's interested in this approach, who wants to learn more, who's interested in taking collective action with us on this. Um, we also want to work um, with other like-minded companies to help refine and codify this methodology. Um, this, I'm incredibly proud of this fingerprints report, and I would say that it is a pretty scrappy first attempt um, and really kind of blazing the trail for this. So I think that there's a lot that we can continue to improve as we go forward and would love to work with others to do that. Uh, and then a huge part of what we want to do is, is to engage our own employees, particularly looking at things like our retirement investments. Um, our employees really have skin in the game. They care a lot um, about the mission of the company. They want to make sure that we are reducing the climate impact that we're driving. And at the end of the day, um, it is also their investments um, in many cases that we're talking about. So we're going to be engaging our entire employee um, base in this work. And I'll land um, and end with our climate pledge. So we have a three-tier approach. Um, we have always We've taken responsibility for our carbon footprint. Going forward, we're also taking responsibility for our carbon fingerprint. Um, we're going to work to reduce our direct impact on the planet uh, through our ongoing sustainability strategy. Through our advocacy program, we're going to be advocating for systemic policy solutions um, because we know that at the end of the day, we have to rapidly accelerate our transition to a just renewable energy economy and keep fossil fuels in the ground. Um, and we are also in the midst of rapidly transforming our approach to philanthropy, investing in frontline communities that are really leading the way out of the climate crisis um, and directing 100% of our giving to organizations that are led by um, indigenous folks and organizations. So we'll be wrapping all of that up um, as we go forward and excited to share our 2022 report um, when we have it. So you all can see um, how much progress we've made in the past, um, in the next year. I'm gonna hand it over to Jeffrey, I think, or maybe Felicity to um, introduce our panelists and hear from each of them. Thank you so much, Kate. That's some really amazing cutting edge work that uh, really sets a new bar for climate disclosure. Thank you so much for sharing that and blazing the trail for other companies to follow. We're gonna hear next from Duncan who comes to us from Clean Creatives, who's doing some amazing work in the world of advertising and creative uh, design. Duncan, uh, tell us uh, what your role was in this and what, you, what, what work you've been doing. All right, I will. Um, thank you very much um, to the whole ASBN team and to Kate also. Um, it, this is a really fantastic step forward. I really have to say that. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful to be a small part of it. So um, I'm the executive director of Clean Creatives, which is a project that is trying to bring together um, advertising, um, PR, and uh, professionals to end the industry's work with fossil fuels. And I think that um, what Seventh Generation has done with this report is a really great step forward towards that. Um, and so I'm going to share my own presentation because um, that's that's how we're going to do it. Um, so you should see um, why clean brands need clean creatives. And uh, I'm just going to walk through sort of our core theory of change with clean creatives and how it brought us here. Um, so our theory about this starts with just the basic climate facts, which is that climate change is happening now. Um, this is the warmest winter it's ever been in my hometown of Austin, Texas. Um, three quarters of dangerous carbon pollution is caused by the energy sector, um, and they are planning to increase the amount that they pollute. Um, and at the same time, we do not need any new fossil fuel projects to meet global energy needs uh, under the Paris Climate Agreement. So our thinking is these fossil fuel companies are not changing, um, and they are using marketing and PR to avoid making the change we need. Um, so why should a non-fossil fuel brand care about fossil fuel ads and PR? Um, this is the core question, I think, for members of ASBN. Um, and here's our answer to that question. Basically, you need to know what fossil fuel ads look like. Um, this is some examples of what they show. They show solar panels, algae magically making oil, um, kids with butterflies, science stuff. Um, 
And based on these ads, you might get an impression that this is an industry that spends a lot on renewable energy, um, and they don't, actually. Um, on average, the fossil fuel industry spends about 1% of its capital expenditures on anything besides fossil fuels. So that includes carbon capture, um, of renewable fuels, renewable energy itself. Um, this is an industry that basically misrepresents itself in every opportunity in public. Um, and greenwashing that they're doing actually harms green brands. Um, so if your advertisement that is promising some false solution by a fossil fuel corporation, that dilutes the impact of genuine efforts to make change. This is one of two things that's going to happen. Either consumers are going to become cynical. Um, they can say, well, you know, if Exxon can get away with saying they're green, why should I believe you when you say you're green? Everyone lies about this. Or it makes it harder for consumers to identify real solutions. They can just sort of say, well, this looks just as good as that. And they can kind of borrow a little bit of your brand credibility. Um, and to put an example of this, of why I think it's so exciting, that, uh, important that seventh generation take this on, if you look at a seventh generation ad like this, um, that is, you know, a company that's making genuine analysis uh, and change, BP can kind of do the same thing. Um, and it looks the same. And it's very easy to confuse consumers. Um, this is true for companies that are in the cosmetics business, Aveda, there's a Shell ad. Um, if you're in, you know, organic dairy or something like that, Chevron can borrow a lot of your imagery as well. So this is not a coincidence, actually. Um, the Your green creative ends up in pitch decks sent to fossil fuel companies. If you work with an advertising agency and they have a fossil fuel company, what that fossil fuel company does is they want to reach your consumers. They want to reach people who are concerned about the environment. So when you are working with them on this creative, on targeting, on analysis of what the problem is, they can take that and then they can go to Shell or whoever and say, we know how to reach consumers who are worried about the environment and convince them that you're not the problem. Um, and this is a this is a known fact. This is you can talk to people in the ad industry and they'll say, yeah, we take in our, our exact copy uh, from one green clean uh, campaign and put it in the dirty client's pitch deck. Um, so. This is uh, comes down to like our core theory here, which is that stopping fossil fuel ads is climate action. Um, this is something that's been really taken up by uh, Antonio Guterres, who is the head of the UN, UN Secretary General. Um, we need to hold fossil fuel companies and their enablers to account. That includes the massive public relations machine breaking in billions to shield the fossil fuel industry from scrutiny. This is something that's really ripening as an issue. Um, and the here's sort of how this works and why we think this is so important. So um, this is uh, Shell's website today. You could go and see their climate target. They say their goal is to become a net zero energy emissions company by 2050. Um, and this is actually the subject of a lawsuit in the Netherlands that ordered Shell to start reducing their emissions because they lied so much about it. Uh, and then if you scroll down on their website, you actually get to this disclaimer, which I think is pretty incredible. Shell's operating plans and budgets do not reflect Shell's net zero emissions target. Um, and if your operating plans and your budget don't reflect your net zero emissions target, your company should not be talking about a net zero emissions target. Um, here's another great example of this from Chevron. 80% of Chevron's ad over a period of, of a year in 2020 and 2021 mentioned something about sustainability and the environment. 1.8% of their capital expenditures went to anything sustainable in that same period of time. 80% versus less than 2%, um, deeply out of step. And this is the result. Um, as of 2021, we hit global uh, carbon emissions hit a peak or are continuing to peak. Um, and this is a very interesting graph to me because you see kind of little ups and downs and dips and maybe a plateau at some point. And it looks a lot like another graph uh, that I found um, of cigarette sales and lung cancer mortality in the United States. Um, you know, you see those same dips and then it reaches a plateau, a little peak and it goes up. But in 1970, the United States banned cigarette ads on radio and television. And something very interesting happened next, which is this. Um, cigarette consumption started to go down permanently. And that's not just because fewer people are seeing ads, but because um, there isn't the communications infrastructure to stop regulatory action. They can't stand in the way of federal taxes on cigarettes going and creep up. They can't get in the way of California banning smoke or so smoking in restaurants. Without that communications infrastructure, their ability to obstruct change is limited. And that's where I think this uh, we can really make some stuff happen. Um, there is a growing movement of agencies and creative professionals and brands that are working to end fossil fuel advertising and PR. Um, I, there's over almost 400 agencies, or sorry, almost 500 agencies that have taken this pledge not to work with fossil fuels. 
Um, but really, we see clients as holding the keys to transforming the advertising industry. And we hear this from professionals we speak with inside major firms. Um, and this is word for word a quote. Um, we need to hear from the companies that shape our bottom line in order to give leadership the incentive to fire our fossil fuel clients. A lot of them really want to do this. People understand it's dirty work. They need to get the kind of inquiries like Seventh Generation has been doing um, to get them to think differently about their uh, how this works uh, for them on their bottom line. So we do have this pledge for brands. Um, I'm happy to talk about this more. I don't want to take up too much time. Basically, it says that in future RFPs and agency reviews, you ask one of your conditions for working with an agency is that they don't have fossil fuel clients. Um, and so uh, this is, I'm happy to talk with you about what that means um, and follow up with you after this. Um, we have over, oh, this is old. Um, so that should say 485 agencies and 1,500 creatives. Um, and as environmental organizations, uh, this is some of the environmental organizations that have supported the project, um, just really friends of ours, uh, climate justice leaders uh, who we're very excited to collaborate with. Um, and we think this is a really important piece of generating major change inside um, business and inside uh, or just with regards to climate action in general. So we believe the future of creativity is clean. And now I will pass the mic. Thank you so much, Duncan. That's fascinating, groundbreaking work as well. We're going to turn next to Paul for an overview of the outdoor policy outfit and the role of corporate finance in driving climate change. Paul? You're muted, I think. Sorry about that. You hear me now? I apologize there. It's, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today, and thanks to ASPN and Tate and the whole sub generation team for um, really sort of picking up on this work and integrating it into your own efforts. And um, yeah, so my name is Paul Moynister. I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Outdoor Policy Outfit, and I'm here to talk today about uh, a project that we've undertaken called the Carbon Bank Roll, which we've done in partnership with our good friends over at Bank Forward and the Climate Safe Lending Network. Um, and so to start here today, really what Kate teed up in terms of sort of the history of sustainability reports and the role that they play and sort of how companies think about what their environmental footprint is and what their potential for impact is, um, is really kind of where we got started. So back in, in spring of 2021, we were, there was all this huge slew of net zero announcements coming out from all of these different companies and these new big sustainability commitments. And as we were looking at those, we started kind of asking the question like, well, why isn't banking in here at all? Why are these companies that have tremendous amount of money and cash and investments, why are they not thinking about that? Um, and so we would we'd go and we'd scour these reports from you know, the Amazons and the Microsofts and the Netflix of the world who are doing incredible work on all aspects of um, corporate sustainable leadership and, and banking, it wasn't in there at all. So we, we, we started with the question of well, like, A, why is that the case? And B, if we measured what those emissions look like, what would that be? And if then if we tied them to their sustainability goals, their net zero commitments, wouldn't that be a really powerful forcing function that would push companies to start thinking of um, leveraging banks and helping them to sort of drive decarbonization of the financial sector? And honestly, when we started running the numbers, we were a little bit um, surprised by what we saw. We'll get to that there in a minute. But um, this whole idea of sort of thinking about, uh, and this is really what um, Seventh Generation has taken and run with with their Climate Fingerprints report, which is this idea of your financial supply chain. And so you have all of these different aspects of your supply chain that your company is working across all the materials and the travel and the energy and all of those different pieces to reduce the, the carbon footprint of those. And so this idea of like, what is your money doing while you're sleeping? What is your cash management? What is your investments? What do your pensions look like? Um, historically, companies have treated their banking and investments as a climate neutral activity. They haven't thought about it as part of it. And they've sort of always seen it as just an, a side piece of their sustainability effort. And so the question was, well, if companies started treating their, their financial supply chain just like they treated all other aspects of their supply chains, um, wouldn't that be a really incredible way to drive the decarbonization of the financial sector? So when we started running the numbers, uh, to be honest, like 
I really had no idea what we would be looking at in terms of, is this, I remember talking to our research partner and I was like, what are we looking at here? 3%, 5%, 10%. And we did a back of the envelope calculation and started finding for companies like Apple and others that was accounting for more than half of their emissions. And so just to quickly walk you through this slide, cause I know it's dense. Um, what we ended up doing in our report is we took these 10 companies. Um, we looked at what their reported carbon emissions are, which is the, the, slide, uh, the, the figure on the left there. And then we took at what are their cash and investments on their balance sheets on the 10Ks that they publicly report. Um, and so that is a number uh, in the billion. So like for PayPal, that's 14.8 billion. And then we used um, a really new methodology that we created to calculate by using um, banking information and investment emissions intensities. Like what is the actual carbon footprint of that cash and investment? And then we compared those to what their reported emissions are. And so um, as you can see, so with a number like uh, 112 for Meta, what that means is that the $48 billion in 2021 that Meta had in cash and investments actually generated 112% of, uh, of emissions compared to their reported scope one, two, and three emissions. And so what that means is that for Meta, Alphabet, um, and PayPal, and Disney, sorry, you can't see this in the slide, but this was just their scope one and two at the time they weren't reporting their scope three emissions. But for those three companies, their cash and investments actually generate more emissions than everything else that their company does combined. And these numbers are tend to be a little bit weighted towards companies that have a lot of cash. Uh, and investments and smaller carbon footprints. And so there's an aspect of this, which is like had Google who's cut their, their carbon footprint by a tremendous amount over the last however many years, like this percentage number is, is slightly misleading in the sense that if they had not done those other climate improvements, their percentage would be lower. But today, as of 2021, what we're looking at is that for almost all of these companies here, it's either they're larger than all of their other emissions combined, one of their or one of their largest sources of emissions. And so to sort of break this down in terms of what this looks like on a company by company level, um, so like in 2021, for example, PayPal's financial footprint, i.e. the emissions that came from their cash and investments, generated 55 times the emissions of their scope one, two, and three combined. Uh, the craziest sort of stat that we came up with in this was that if they had kept their um, emissions footprint from all of their operations consistent until 2076, that would be the, the entirety of the cumulative carbon footprint of the 55 year period would be what it would take to just have what their finance emissions was in 2021. And so um, that's very much an outlier because they are a cash rich company with a very tiny footprint, but it's just a really fascinating sort of perspective for what, what the potential impact of this is at the, at the maximum. And so even for a company like Google, when you look at what this compared to their scope one emissions, which are really substantial for a company that has as big of an operational footprint as they have, like you're looking at 38 times larger than their scope one emissions over the last five years combined. And so... Um, it's pretty staggering. And you look at Netflix and like worldwide streaming of Netflix is considerably smaller than their financial footprint was in 2021. And so the question is like, how is this possible? How is it possible that for a company like Microsoft that has, a, you know, a huge operational footprint and tremendous scope three emissions, how is it possible that their banking and investments is um, their largest source of emissions? And that lies in the fact that when companies have a hundred, you know, a, a cash and investments, it's not just sitting in a bank account accruing interest. It's going out into the world and funding lots of things. And when those things get funded, it locks in decades of emissions. And so what essentially is happening is banks are taking the short-term cash that you put in a bank and then investing it into uh, long-term infrastructure that racks up decades of emissions and locks us into a carbon intensive future. And so um, importantly, and I don't have this data in the slide yet because it's not public yet, but just when, just to give you a scale of this, um, uh, research that we've done shows that uh, basically in 2020, and we'll have new 2022 data soon, um, for the biggest six banks in the country, the Chase's, Bank of America's, et cetera, of the world, um, if you uh, have, for every dollar that they invest, 24 cents of that dollar is being invested into the carbon intensive sectors that are driving climate change. And so um, if we're gonna get to net zero by 2050, that number has to drop dramatically uh, and get as close to zero as possible. 
And so, um, you know, for a lot of folks, um, the banking sector, and even for a lot of the companies that we've been talking to that have incredible, sophisticated, uh, and knowledgeable and sizable um, uh, sustainability teams, the role that the financial sector plays as the invisible hand of the environmental crisis is still somewhat unknown. And so just a few statistics here to kind of highlight what we're looking at when we say that the banking sector is the invisible hand of the climate crisis, which is that since the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, the world's 60 largest banks have invested over $4.6 trillion in the fossil fuel industry. For the big four American banks, that's 1.2 trillion over that time. Um, just as the scale of comparison, like the Inflation Reduction Act was, I forget the exact number, but it was somewhere around 700 million and nodding heads if that's right, I think it's 700 billion, excuse me. So like pales in comparison to what we're talking about here. And um, if you took the financial sector for the United States in 2020, and you sort of calculated the emissions of the eight largest banks and 10 largest asset managers, it would, and you, and you took that emissions footprint and called it a country, it would be the fifth largest emitter in the world just below Russia. So essentially, the US financial sector as a whole is the fifth largest emitter in the world. And so, um, and that's just in the US. In the UK, the UK's financial sector generates 1.8 times the emissions of the entire country. And so, um, when we look at really the opportunities, and sorry, this is a little bit of a, uh, a text dense slide here, but I'll, I'll summarize quickly to say the seismic impact of this is really tremendous. When you look at that 24% of money that, and this is just within these 10 companies. And if you extrapolate this out to the Fortune 500 and all of the great green responsible companies in the world, this number grows tremendously. But um, if you took those 10 companies that had in 2021, $665 billion in cash and investments, and you just took that 24% of the money that they're, of their money that's currently being invested, um, essentially in those carbon intensive sectors, that and put it towards green investments, that'd be a $160 billion investment um, in green infrastructure. And when you take those 10 companies and you say, well, year on year, and these are average annual emissions, and say that those 10 companies financed emissions alone are the annual emissions of 12.8 or uh, 12.9 million cars in the United States, their annual emissions. And so if those companies just cut their financed emissions in half, it would be the equivalent of taking 6.4 million cars off the road. And that's just with those 10 companies. And so all of this leads us to the question of saying, great, we know this is important, what do we do? And the reality is that as, as seventh generation and others are discovering, we're really in the early days of this. Um, just like the organics were 20 years ago, like good options in the supply chain don't really exist right now. And so um, there, the, the sort of four key actions that companies can take is one, uh, and we're happy to work with you on all of this, just as we did with some generation. And we'll have some new methodologies coming out that will be public tools that companies can use uh, later this year, hopefully. But the ability to measure and publish your finance emissions. So calculate what your cash and investments are doing. Put it as part of your sustainability reports. Secondly, go and engage with your financial institutions. Ask them what their policies are around this. Ask them if they're measuring their emissions. We're in the process of working with Bank Forward and others to develop a questionnaire that you can take, and that will be live. I was hoping to be ready for this call. Uh, hopefully next week um, that we can be sure to distribute to the network where you can take these questions and go to your bank and engage with them and evaluate whether or not they're actually, you know, uh, being climate responsible. Um, the third thing is to go and demonstrate that you actually care about this. And so um, you can, you know, go talk to your bank, break up with your bank, um, switch banks to other banks, break up your banking. If you have money that you can move, if you like that has lower liquidity or service needs, you can move that to smaller green banks, um, like an amalgamated bank or a local credit union. Um, and you can work with your banks to try to get them and demonstrate a demand for green financial products. Um, the last thing is really kind of helping catalyze this seismic change. Um, you know, I, and I don't want to speak for the seventh generation here, but I think with their, their, their fingerprints report, they're saying this, which is the future of corporate sustainability and that toolkit that companies use when they think about measuring and reducing um, their impact and using it as an opportunity for catalytic change. Banking, investments, pensions all become a part of that toolkit moving forward. And so by 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 taking this seriously, by making it a best practice, by telling other companies to do it, by leading by example, we can really institutionalize 
um, corporate financial supply chain emissions as a cornerstone of corporate sustainability moving forward. So um, I'm sure there's probably a lot of questions because this stuff is uh, kind of a bit uh, wonky and weedy at times, but um, really just want to say thank you all for being here and thank you to some generation at ASBM for the opportunity to share our research and excited to have the opportunity to um, answer questions. So uh, thank you. I'll pass it back. Thank you, Paul. That's wonderful and a little scary at the same time, perhaps a tad depressing as well. Uh, next up is um, Mary, who is on, comes from the Climate Finance Action, and she's going to talk specifically about the role that corporate retirement plans have in driving the climate crisis. Mary? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, my name's Mary Cerulli. I go by she, her. It's great to be here. Um, hard to follow all this great work. Um, I'm glad I'm here. I learned a ton. Um, but I, I am here to kind of follow up with, um, let's see, uh, like Jeff said, the um, retirement plan side of this equation. And uh, oops, here we go. Here's our front page. Um, greening your retirement savings plans. You've heard about cash. You've heard about materials. You've heard about some great ambitions led by, um, by seventh generation. And we're really talking about um, here in the next um, seven or eight minutes, the, the retirement plans that your employ employers sponsor. And a little bit about uh, Climate Finance Action. We're a nonprofit, we're women-led. Uh, we uh, really make sure that we're educating stakeholders to understand the financial drivers of the climate crisis and the untapped power of investments to ensure a sustainable future. And, and we really believe that retirement plans and pension plans, they're different. Um, can leverage their outsized customer power to demand action from those big investors that were mentioned. Um, and, and these big adventure, uh, investors manage your retirement savings. And I, I just like to give a shout out to the Sunrise Project who has a, a, pro, a project called uh, Work for Climate. And so we've been working with them to um, kind of peel back the onion and figure out how to provide this education and then to scale it. Because like Kate said, this collective action is really powerful um, and it gives me hope. Um, so moving on, a busy slide, but we all know this um, or we've been alluding to this that the financial system really needs not only to shift trillions of dollars into a sustainable and energy transition investments, but the, the problem is if we don't do it, we know that um, you know, it's pretty catastrophic. And I don't wanna be a Debbie Downer, but what we're looking at here is 37 trillion in retirement assets. That's a huge number. So let's let's mobilize it, right? Um, so what you might be thinking, what is climate safe investing? Well, I'm just I'm going to make sure I get this right because we have the International Sustainability Standards Board, and they have said um, uh, a, a fairly um, a recent update that its definition of sustainability, the ability for a company to sustainably maintain resources and relationships with and manage its dependencies and impacts within its whole business ecosystem over the short, medium, and long term. And then, and we've heard, we've heard uh, Kate talk about this. We've heard Paul, the advertising is so important. And I, I also want to point to the third bullet point, um, which is we're asking those big investors to use their shareholder power to pressure banks, insurers, consumer goods companies, auto companies, um, the whole kit and caboodle to align with a 1.5. Well, I guess we have to call it a 2.0 degree world. and 
don't let anyone fool you because lower returns, sorry, that's like, it's just not true. Um, plenty of think tanks and super brainiacs that have proven that. Um, so uh, your employer sponsored defined contribution retirement plans. These four boxes just kind of set it up to kind of get everyone's brain in the same place. So you have your institution, um, you have employees that contribute um, every pay period, hopefully everyone's doing that. Um, and, and, and that retirement savings goes into investment options. And your investment options um, are chosen by your employer. And a lot of them have, uh, you know, have um, not so great investment options, but also investors that aren't using that shareholder power. And so what does that do? That creates, that creates super risk. We know that the climate crisis is systemic. We can't, we can't diversify it away. And then this slide just kind of is a visual on what happens. Like employees provide the capital or provide the savings. It goes into options that your employer chooses. And these options are inevitably with some of these huge asset managers. And so the vanguards, the Black Rocks, the Fidelities, they invest um, those assets on behalf of clients. So on behalf of you, on behalf of your employer. And so what they get, they get a fee for doing that work. And I just want to really um, just, I don't want to emphasize it, but we need to talk about the target date fund. And the target date fund is a great product. It's kind of like set it, forget it. I'm going to retire in 2050. And that portfolio changes. And it really offers um, the employee exposure to, a, to the markets, to different asset classes. It's super convenient. It's uh, investments chosen by real professionals and um, endorsed by an employer. And the reason, the real reason why we, we need to kind of just put this in the back of our minds is that typically two thirds of a company's savings are directed to these target date funds. Now we're working with a big hospital chain and they're public health people. Um, and their whole, their, their CFO, their sustainability um, climate leadership people and um, their key leaders now understand that out of 80,000 employees, two thirds of those savings are going into that target date fund. And once again, I just wanna emphasize what Paul looked at as well as Duncan, is that when you look at these um, retirement plans and you think about what portion of investments are really adding to the problem in terms of their overall kind of business. And you look at healthcare and 97% of those emissions are coming from uh, scope three uh, and, and including that, that includes that retirement assets. So you can look at these pie charts and say, of course, energy and utilities, a lot more is gonna be coming from their actual uh, modes of business. But um, when you get into um, like consumer goods, you know, we have 89% are from that 401k. So just like corporate cash, you're like, whoa, our business might be trying to get clean, but what about those investments? Um, in terms of who's managing those investments, once again, though, these are the, the big, sometimes people call them the big three, um, BlackRock, Vanguard, to some degree, State Street and Fidelity are in there. You'll see some, some, um, some companies I put down there on the bottom that aren't so big, but they kind of are brand names. And they are um, really the, um, the target date engines, which we've discussed before that are so important for um, retirement plans. And so, so what? So what? Well, these asset managers, just like the big banks, are 
incredibly um, influential. They, I mean, we can go down into the weeds, but just believe me, they have, um, they have so, they're so big and they own so many companies that they have this influence when it comes to directing those companies' um, strategies. And so uh, we worry about the high emitters. Um, well, if these big investors aren't on the same page and pressuring them to go to a low carbon business model, I mean, you know, we got to get, they're not going to, they're, they're not going to answer to Mary Cerulli. They're going to answer to these big shareholders. Um, I just want to point out that they don't have the policies embedded in their business like seventh generation does about um, deforestation, their supply chains. They don't have climate lobbying and political spending policies um, in place. And they really fail to use their power to vote for climate, to vote for equality at some of these um, recalcitrant companies. And so what does that mean for us? I mean, I think of the, about this and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's too big, but it's not if you take certain steps. And I think we've all here thought about how to engage and educate others, how to really um, identify the key decision makers um, at your company. And, and we know that there are influencers. Uh, we need to understand our company's motivations and kind of power map that. Um, and then we got, and then, and then those people uh, can, can really shape with those influencers, what they're going to do in terms of providing options, but also thinking about this default option called a target date fund and how we can make that cleaner. And finally, um, this is just a basic, I mean, I'm from financial services, so it sound, this like makes a lot of sense to me. It's in my DNA, um, uh, but, but some things to think about in terms of your employer-sponsored uh, retirement savings plan is that you know, we can help you. Others are thinking about this too. Financial advisors can help you, um, but there's a sense of, once again, gathering the information, looking at the fees, um, uh, thinking about, does my employer also match? And then and then finally, that bottom one that we've talked about is assessing your, your investment options because there's things out there. That's what's the killer about this. Like we have, we have the ways to do these things, but um, uh, we just need to get the will and we need to get the, um, you know, not get, not get too worried that it's too big. Okay, check. Thanks, Mary. Uh, great information for all of us who have retirement funds. And uh, now we have a little time for questions. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A for our uh, esteemed panel here. Christina Cobb sent in the first question. She, she asks, which of the major banks have the least investment in fossil fuels, the smallest carbon footprint? Where do we bank as a responsible business that needs full service commercial banking capabilities? And before we have, I guess, uh, Paul answer that, I can tell you that ASBN banks with Amalgamated and we've been with them for many years and are very, very happy with the full service uh, work we get from them. But Paul, your thoughts? Yeah, um, I would definitely, um... Thank you for the question. And um, Jeff, to echo that, I would definitely, if you can bank with Amalgamated I mean, as a commercial bank, they are your best option um, just to put scale in it. Like their carbon footprint is, uh, their emissions intensity is, and I need to get updated numbers on this, so please don't quote me, but somewhere around 20 kilotons per billion. And the big six banks on average are around 150 kilotons per billion. Um, Within those big six banks, there is variance. Um, the data on all of this is a bit squishy right now. And so I would be a little remiss to say like of those the, from the data that we have, and this is old data and we're updating it now of the big six being 
know, B of A, Chase, City, Wells Fargo, uh, Goldman Sachs, and um, Morgan Stanley. Wells Fargo actually has, uh, in 2020 at least, had the lowest emissions intensity, but I wouldn't anchor on that and move your banking to them just because of that data. Um, if you are looking for a bigger bank, like a more mid-sized bank, um, the best option that we know of right now is First Republic Bank. Um, they are sort of a better bank, to be honest, almost by accident in that they just haven't invested in fossil fuels. It's not been a principle of theirs, and they don't do a lot of the reporting and things that we've asked them to do. And so if you are interested in First Republic Bank, we would certainly encourage you to go talk to them and express to them why you're interested in that and help embolden them to actually embrace on their sort of accidental leadership and turn it into sort of more formal public leadership. But I hope that helps answer the question. Thanks, Paul. Question for Duncan. Duncan, uh, what's the best way for companies to start raising the issue of fossil fuel greenwashing with their advertising and PR agencies? Um, just ask the question, do you have fossil fuel clients? Do you plan on keeping them? Like really, if you just begin the conversation, um, we found that really does send up a flag and that you can um, provide a lot of help to the people who might be advocating for that already. Um, and yeah, it, it really does begin with just asking and that just being asked and having them recognize that this is a concern for you is extremely valuable. Um, Kate, I know that y'all did this as part of the report and, and there's some data in there. And I, I'm quite sure when they got that email from you, it was something that uh, probably sent some waves back. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, what I, I was um, going to hop in just to say that the Clean Creatives Pledge is a great place to start if you're if you're wondering what do I actually need to ask? You know, what, what do I need to know to go into this? And so we created a survey um, that we we based directly on the Clean Creatives pledge. So the, the things that Clean Creatives is asking folks to commit to, we kind of flipped around and turned into questions for all of our agencies and sent that out as a survey. There were definitely a few folks that we had to chase down, um, but most folks responded pretty quickly. And we are also as we work to sort of implement lessons learned from the report. We're moving towards building those questions into any sort of outgoing RFP process or contract renewal or renewal process. So on a really tactical level, I would, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. I think that you, Clean Creators has a ton of great resources to figure out exactly what is the information that you should be um, looking for and how do you want to kick off that conversation. And, and I would just add that it, it's the kind of conversation that agencies are used to hearing from clients. You know, a lot of clients uh, include, you know, DEI commitments, um, you know, other sustainability metrics. They're sort of used to seeing things not directly related to your work included as part of an RFP process. So you won't be, um, you know, overturning any tables here. They're they're kind of aware of and, and know that this is a concern that people have. Thank you. And uh, we have time for one more question for Kate. So companies like to make progress and like to tell people they're doing better and better every year and like to be making their emissions smaller. Seventh generation has sort of boldly gone in a different direction and in some ways expanded its impact rather than uh, being able to talk about contracting it. Were there any challenges in doing that internally? I, I'm, I, we had the conversation, absolutely. And I think, I don't think she would mind me quoting her. Um, when we brought this idea to our leadership team, I remember really clearly our CEO saying, wow, like this makes me feel nervous. You know, like there's not a lot of things that make me feel nervous um, in this way, but this really, this really does. And I think it was for exactly that reason, that idea of we don't know what we don't know in this space. I think most companies, um, when you are talking about starting to dig into this um, impact of corporate cash, you don't know what you don't know. Um, luckily for seventh generation, our CEO took that as an indication that this was exactly the right direction. This was, you know, we needed to you know, run directly into that discomfort um, to make sure that we fully understood our climate impact so that we could successfully set strategy against it. So um, I'm happy to say that while folks under folks, I think were very clear eyed and understanding that we were going to discover some skeletons in our closet. That was the purpose of the exercise. Um, but there was a real willingness um, to do that excavation um, 
So we were able, we had a ton of support going into it. Thanks, Kate. Thanks everybody for listening today. Thanks for the leadership that Seventh Generation has provided. Paul, Duncan, Mary, thanks for your groundbreaking work and your willingness to help other companies on this journey. We really want to encourage ASBN members to reach out to these individuals to look at your own impact in new ways so that you can better mitigate your CO2 emissions. So thanks everybody, this has been a great session. It's recorded if you wanna to listen to it, the recording is listed in the chat and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks everybody.